And I work statewide on a lot of these varieties from a disease perspective and so I'm just going to go through these quickly for those of you that are interested in high yields and good quality because disease kind of ruins both of those in a given year and so we work a lot in trying to help you achieve your goals in those areas without having to spend a ton of money on growing these rices. 1124 that James mentioned we worked with a number of years got a really good disease package so that's a that's an interesting line from that perspective as well as it being early the 1067 we're still evaluating on the medium grains we don't show it here but there's a new medium grain that's a clear field medium grain called 261 and that's the first clear field medium grain we've had released uh, it's out of the LSU breeding program through Horizon Ag. Uh, high yield potential type rice, but major, major problems and risks for us. One's neck blast, the other's bacterial panicle blight. And I'll just mention that latter disease because that's what kind of put us out of the Bengal business. Years like this where it's hot, hot nights, favor that disease, and we just got to where we couldn't grow Bengal and get it to yield. So CL261, unfortunately, is already in that category. It's going to be very susceptible. So we're going to have to position it in order to try to help manage that if you want to grow the clear field technology medium grain to try to manage those, those two diseases. It's not going to be a variety for, you know, where you don't have water and you have a lot of blast history. And two, we're going to have to be out there early and try to battle the bacterial panicle blight if it's accepted by the industry as a grain type. Jupiter, still the way to go for Arkansas because one, the industry likes it, two, it's, it's partially resistant to bacterial panicle blight so its yield stays up and uh, the other diseases are kind of manageable. It has a blast problem but we can kind of manage it with water and fungicides. Chief blight's a little bit more rambunctious on it than we'd like but we can manage that with fungicides so Jupiter's still the way to go at this point in time until James comes along with something that's going to blow them all out of the water, right James? Um, I just mentioned from a disease perspective some of these others that are interesting to me. Uh, Roy J and Taggart, they're the highest yielding conventional rice is around from this point on and uh, they manageable disease package. Well, what we're looking for, high yield, high quality, at least manageable disease risk, right? So those combine all that. The only thing that I've seen on them that might concern me a little bit is a little bit of false smut if they're planted late. But, you know, that gets on everything anyway. So we're just kind of struggling with that one at this point, too. Templeton, a new release from Dr. Moldenhauer's program, is a higher yielding, very good blast resistant line. So where you have blast history and you need a long grain, that one has the best thing going. Its yield potential is better than Catahoula or Cybonnet or some of those. So that's, uh, that's a contribution in that area. The 151s on a lot of acreage has major disease risks, but we kind of can manage it if we cut back on fertilizer, we use a lot of water and fungicides. It has high yield potential, but I think in some areas we might have cut back too much on the fertilizer. It looks kind of kind of rough in some areas now. We don't have CL111 here. That's a new clear field long grain that we've worked with quite a bit. That one, very weak on sheath blight, but it's probably underrated on its yield potential and stuff. It looks pretty good to me in a lot of places, but sheath blight's gonna probably eat it alive, so you'll have to stay out in front of it. The one that I'm really excited about on the clear field long grains is that 142 that Karen talked about. From a disease perspective, very similar to Wells. So far, no ugly surprises for us. And in the seed fields I've been in, very impressive looking. So if it yields as good as it looks, uh, it's, I think it's going to be pretty impressive. There's some really nice fields of the CL181 around. Jimmy, you got one of them, right? You got a good feel of that 181. It's an impressive looking semidwarf clear field long grain. We have some concern about this panicle blight on it. Now typically that doesn't bother the long grains in commercial fields. There's a couple of fields where that's a problem in some of the long grains this year because we've got the hot nights 
but we're hoping that'll just be a minimal thing because otherwise it's got a uh, reasonable package, sheath blight we can control and that sort of thing. Not seeing a lot of blast on it this year. So 181 may be another another uh, nice alternative to some of the other clear field long grains. And then lastly, uh, we've looked at the 1030 that James has, the Semidwarf long grain, the kind of conventional Semidwarf long grain. It's really the most uh, beautiful semidwarf long grain in the program. If you look at plots across the state. So that one's probably gonna have some interest to people to at least try because of its appearance and yield potential. Questions about diseases, problems? Yes, sir? It's pretty hard to steer your way through all the diseases in picking out varieties. And when you talk about fertility on the 151, do you have any idea how how low we could bring or where we need to bring that fertilizer or that nitrogen before we increase diseases? You know, this is a good question. And we have a young man here, Trent Roberts, I hope that will talk about, and Rick Norman, that will talk about the, the nitrogen soil test some that will help guide us a little bit better on these fields. What we've done with 151 is last year we pushed it really hard. So, it, you know, we lodged it a lot of places and we had lots of disease problems. So this year a lot of guys decided well, I'm not going to have that problem again, so we're going to cut back. Well, because we don't know exactly what's in the soil or how to, you know, how to manage, we probably cut back too far, and so the variety looks much different, and probably its yield potential has been hurt in some of those fields. But it's going to stand up, and it doesn't have as much disease problem. So we'd like to get in the middle there, and I think this soil test would help at least you know those of us that are helping farmers manage rice uh, kind of guess better at these different fields is how much to put on there because the soil nitrogen reservoir varies a lot at least in this state so we're we're interested in that technology and so 151 is probably going to be a good example where we need something where we got a number that will help us guide nitrogen applications but it makes a dramatic difference. And I will tell you on this bacterial panicle blight, nitrogen makes a big dramatic difference on it in our experience. If, you got, if you're pushing with lots of nitrogen, that disease just kind of blows up. And you can moderate it some with nitrogen. And I think most diseases are like that. You can't completely control them, but you can minimize them with, you know, with the right fertility. Speaking of fertility, I will say this, at least in our state, we have a lot of soils that are a little bit low in potassium and the low potassium and disease problems go together hand in hand. So if you're not, if you're not maintaining or building your soil, you're just, you're just going to be using a lot of fungicides.